what I'm going to talk to you about today is um, work that we've been doing over the last few years looking at the um, developmental regulation of cardiac regenerative capacity in mammals. And uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about work uh, looking at various uh, cellular mechanisms that are involved in, in cardiac regeneration in neonatal mice, uh, at both myocyte contributions as well as non-myocyte contributions. And I'll talk about some uh, molecular mechanisms that we've been looking at uh, that uh, appear to be involved in, in uh, regulating this developmental transition. Okay, so uh, why are we interested in cardiac uh, regeneration? Um, it, it's known that uh, the adult mammalian heart has an extremely uh, limited capacity to regenerate following injury. Uh, and indeed, it's estimated that following uh, a myocardial infarction that the adult human heart uh, can lose up to a billion uh, cardiomyocytes uh, within the space of just a few hours. Uh, and the vast majority of these cardiomyocytes are not uh, regenerated. Uh, and, and the current best estimates from uh, Richard Lee's lab suggest that only about 3% of cardiomyocytes are turned over or replenished uh, following a myocardial infarction in adult uh, mammals. And so in the absence of an appreciable regenerative response, the adult mammalian heart undergoes a series of important uh, pathological remodeling events. Uh, and this includes the replacement of these lost cardiomyocytes with non-contractile scar tissue, uh, as well as the uh, pathological enlargement of the remaining viable myocardium. Uh, and these remodeling events ultimately drive the heart towards uh, contractile failure and dysfunction. And so there's been a, um, a huge amount uh, of uh, energy and, and interest in the field over, over a number of years now uh, in trying to uh, develop uh, strategies uh, for cardiac regeneration. And, and a number of different um, approaches have been uh, proposed, and, and they include uh, the activation of uh, resident cardiomyocytes to re-enter the cell cycle and divide, um, uh, isolation of uh, adult uh, stem cell populations, uh, which can be expanded ex vivo and then reintroduced into the heart, uh, or indeed the delivery of factors that might be able to harness the uh, regenerative potential of these resident uh, stem cell populations. Uh, there's also been a lot of work uh, in the area of um, uh, generating cardiomyocytes from pluripotent stem cell populations. And there was a, a big paper from uh, Chuck Murray's group uh, very recently on the uh, uh, delivery of embryonic stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes into the heart. And also uh, work from Deepak uh, Srivastava and Eric Olson's group uh, looking at direct lineage reprogramming, so converting fibroblasts into cardiomyocytes in situ in the heart. And so we believe that all of these um, strategies represent uh, potentially uh, viable uh, avenues towards cardiac regeneration. Um, but what we're uh, also interested in is in trying to understand how the heart can uh, regenerate naturally uh, following injury and, and what mechanisms have evolved uh, throughout uh, evolution and, and uh, during development uh, that might be able to give us clues uh, in terms of identifying mechanisms towards uh, heart regeneration. And so we've been uh, inspired by work in the zebrafish and, uh, and the salamander, which uh, are really highly uh, regenerative uh, organisms. And indeed, these uh, organisms can regenerate uh, entire fins, uh, limbs, uh, and various organ systems uh, throughout life uh, following I injury. And uh, in a landmark study uh, by uh, Ken Poss and Mark Keating uh, over a decade or so ago now, uh, they showed that the adult zebrafish heart was able to completely regenerate uh, following apical resection injury. And so what they did is they uh, injured uh, the two-chambered uh, adult zebrafish ventricle, and they removed about 20% of the uh, ventricular apex. And what they found was that over a period of, of 60 days following injury, the zebrafish was able to mount uh, a regenerative response that led to the replacement of these lost cardiomyocytes uh, and the restoration of cardiac function. And this process involved the initial formation of a blood clot at the site of injury, uh, extensive uh, fibrin and extracellular matrix deposition, uh, and, and uh, uh, rapid uh, myocardial expansion to replace these lost cardiomyocytes. Um, the cellular source of these uh, regenerated cardiomyocytes in the zebrafish uh, has been uh, a little controversial. Uh, it was initially thought that these uh, cardiomyocytes were derived from a stem cell population uh, residing in the epicardium. Uh, but more recent uh, genetic lineage tracing studies from uh, Ken Poss's lab and uh, Juan Belmonte's lab uh, suggest that the vast majority of these regenerated cardiomyocytes in the zebrafish uh, are derived from uh, pre-existing cardiomyocytes that uh, proliferate following injury. So cardiomyocyte proliferation seems to be the main 
uh, cellular mechanism driving uh, cardiomyocyte replenishment in the zebrafish heart uh, rather than differentiation of, of a stem cell population. So we became uh, particularly uh, interested uh, in, in these findings in the zebrafish because it's been known uh, for many years that the uh, mammalian heart undergoes a number of important developmental transitions uh, around the time of birth. And, and one of the most important of these transitions is that mammalian cardiomyocytes exit the cell cycle shortly after birth uh, and they lose their uh, proliferative capacity. Um, so uh, in, in really some classic studies by uh, Lauren Field's group and, and others, uh, it, it's been well known that uh, during early embryogenesis in rodents, uh, the rates of DNA synthesis are very high. So embryonic cardiomyocytes uh, during rodent heart development uh, undergo high uh, rates of, of DNA synthesis and cell proliferation. And these rates of DNA synthesis decrease with in increasing embryonic age. And then shortly after birth, uh, there's a final round of DNA synthesis and karyokinesis or nuclear division, uh, which occurs in the absence of cytokinesis. Uh, and this results in the binucleation of the vast majority of rodent cardiomyocytes uh, in, in these first two weeks uh, after birth. And so we wondered uh, whether the uh, early postnatal heart, which uh, uh, contains predominantly mononucleated cells, uh, which uh, retain proliferative potential, we wondered whether the neonatal heart might also have significant cardiac regenerative potential. And so uh, what we did uh, a few years ago is we established a surgical model of cardiac injury in one-day-old mice uh, where we're able to amputate um, a, a small portion of the cardiac uh, ventricular apex uh, from these one-day-old mice. And this resulted in the removal of about 15% uh, of the cardiac ventricle uh, following injury. Uh, this work was published a few years ago, and essentially what we found is that the one-day-old neonatal mice were able to uh, regenerate following apical resection injury, and that this process uh, occurred through a series of events that was uh, similar to what uh, was observed in the zebrafish. Uh, this included the formation of a, a blood clot at the site of injury, uh, infiltration of inflammatory cells, uh, extensive mycite uh, proliferation and extracellular matrix deposition, and then by day 21, uh, we really saw little, uh, very little evidence of fibrosis uh, and uh, regeneration of the apex and restoration of cardiac function. So this was um, uh, nice and it, it demonstrated that the neonate uh, has some uh, capacity for regeneration during early postnatal life. Uh, but obviously, uh, removing a portion of the uh, ventricle is not really a very uh, physiologically or disease relevant uh, type of injury. And so more recently, uh, we have uh, established a model of myocardial infarction in one-day-old mice uh, involving permanent ligation of the left anterior descending uh, coronary artery. And so this work, again, was um, published uh, recently, just last year. Uh, and essentially what we found is that the neonatal heart can also uh, regenerate following myocardial infarction. And this uh, process involves early uh, myocyte necrosis, inflammation and, and uh, hemorrhaging at day three post-infarction, uh, at day seven post-infarction, uh, we see extensive extracellular matrix deposition. And interestingly, uh, this fibrotic tissue uh, begins to regress and become marginalized towards the periphery of the heart uh, by day 14 post-injury. And by day 21, we see little evidence of fibrosis with the exception of a small region of scar tissue around the permanent ligature. And what we found, uh, importantly, is that this uh, regenerative response in the neonatal heart again, is associated with a, a robust and widespread activation of cardiomyocyte uh, proliferation at day seven following injury. So one of the, uh, the nice things about this uh, myocardial infarction model uh, is that we can perform these surgeries at every um, postnatal developmental age. And so we're able to uh, map out the developmental loss of cardiac regenerative uh, capacity uh, following infarction of these neonatal hearts. And uh, as you can see here, in contrast to the one-day-old heart, which uh, regenerates a, a substantial portion of the uh, infarcted tissue at, at day 21 following ligation, uh, you can see that the regenerative res response is uh, severely impaired in the seven-day-old heart, uh, and it's completely uh, gone by postnatal day 14, uh, where you see these uh, large fibrotic scars, uh, thinning of the ventricular wall, uh, and, and dilation of the chambers. And so there's really this reciprocal relationship uh, between cardiac regenerative capacity and fibrosis uh, that's happening during these first uh, two weeks uh, after birth. Okay, so what I've told you um, so far is that the neonatal uh, mouse heart can 
uh, regenerate following multiple uh, forms of cardiac injury, including a myocardial infarction, uh, and that this process involves uh, the activation of cardiomyocyte proliferation. This is similar uh, to the regenerative response uh, following injury in the adult zebrafish. And so, of course, uh, we and others have been very interested uh, in trying to identify uh, molecular mechanisms uh, that might regulate cardiomyocyte proliferative capacity and that could potentially be targeted for cardiac regeneration uh, in adulthood. <clears throat> and so what I'll show you now are, uh, are four uh, examples where we've uh, used um, the power of uh, mouse genetics to begin to dissect uh, the relative importance of, of different uh, signaling pathways in regulating uh, myocyte proliferation, uh, and these studies have really established an important role for cardiomyocyte proliferation uh, during the neonatal regenerative response. And these are studies uh, both from the Olsen and Sadek labs, as well as uh, James Martin's group, uh, who, who uh, published some work recently using these models. And so what we found is that if you overexpress uh, this microRNA, MIR-195, uh, in cardiomyocytes, and you then subject uh, the one-day-old mice to a myocardial infarction, that in contrast to the wild-type mice, which regenerate, uh, the transgenic mice, which have uh, less cardiomyocyte proliferation, uh, also have uh, increased uh, scar tissue and, and less regeneration. Uh, similarly, we've shown that uh, conditionally overexpressing uh, this uh, transcription factor, MES1, uh, which activates the expression of um, uh, certain uh, tumor suppressor pathways in cardiomyocytes, uh, is also sufficient to repress cardiomyocyte proliferative capacity. And again, this um, impairs the regenerative response and is associated with increased scar tissue at day 21 following injury. Uh, probably the most striking example uh, of the importance of, of cardiomyocyte proliferation comes from uh, some recent studies where uh, the uh, downstream uh, effector of the HIPPO signaling pathway, YAP, was uh, conditionally deleted from cardiomyocytes, uh, and this was sufficient to completely uh, abolish the regenerative response of the one-day-old heart uh, following a myocardial infarction. You can see clearly uh, that the YAP uh, knockout mice uh, have these um, large uh, scars and, and thinning of the ventricular wall, uh, similar to the, the uh, remodeling response that's characteristic of the adult heart following injury. And uh, this recent study from uh, James Martin's group has shown that uh, if you knock out uh, Salvador, which is an upstream component of the HIPPO signaling pathway, uh, you can actually prolong the proliferative capacity of cardiomyocytes in the postnatal period. Uh, and this is sufficient to substantially uh, restore the regenerative capacity of the seven-day-old heart uh, following uh, apical resection injury. So what I've uh, shown you so far is that uh, the neonatal mouse heart can uh, regenerate following uh, multiple uh, forms of cardiac injury, that this regenerative response involves uh, the activation of cardiomyocyte proliferation, and we've identified a few uh, signaling pathways that seem to play uh, an important role uh, in, in regulating myocyte proliferative capacity in the neonatal period, and that have also established an important role for myocyte proliferation uh, in the regenerative response. And this includes uh, the uh, HIPPO signaling pathway, uh, microRNAs, including members of the MIR-15 family, and the transcription factor, uh, MIS-1. So what I'm going to talk about in the next uh, uh, 15 minutes or so is, is a new uh, story that we've been working on, uh, an unpublished work uh, from uh, my own group, uh, where we've been very interested in the, um, the role of uh, chromatin remodeling during the neonatal period, uh, and in particular, uh, mechanisms of um, uh, transcriptional control uh, that might be involved in, in guiding cardiomyocyte uh, maturation during the neonatal period. And so it's well known that uh, cell differentiation events are associated with a number of uh, uh, histone uh, and uh, modifications and, and alterations in chromatin structure. Uh, this uh, figure here is taken from a nice review from uh, Benoit Bruneau's group. Uh, and, and what you can see here is that uh, there are many different uh, pathways that are engaged uh, that can either methylate DNA uh, or, or modify um, uh, chromatin accessibility, uh, as well as uh, uh, transcriptionally uh, uh, repress genes or activate genes, uh, depending on, on various modifications to the histones. And it's been proposed that these um, uh, chromatin modifications play a really important role in cell differentiation events and could potentially uh, be targeted uh, for uh, dedifferentiation as well. And so we've been um, particularly interested in the role of chromatin modifications during the uh, immediate postnatal period uh, when the cardiomyocytes are differentiating and withdrawing from the cell cycle. Um, this is a, a figure taken from a nice uh, paper from Rob McClellan's group 
uh, where they've looked at a number of different uh, chromatin marks uh, in embryonic cardiomyocytes compared to adult cardiomyocytes. And as you can see, uh, there are a, a number of uh, uh, major changes in, in various histone marks uh, from the embryonic stages uh, to the adult stages of, of cardiac development. And what they found was that heterochromatin, uh, which is associated with the compact uh, chromatin structure and, and gene silencing, accumulates with cardiac differentiation. Uh, they found that this histone mark uh, H3K9 trimethylation, which is uh, associated with transcriptional repression, uh, increases in adult cardiomyocytes, and it increases uh, particularly at E2F dependent promoters, which are associated with cell cycle genes. Um, however, uh, curiously, uh, they did not look at the role of DNA methylation uh, in, in this paper. Uh, and also, there are, there are very few studies on the role of DNA methylation during cardiac development. And so we became uh, interested uh, in trying to map out uh, changes in DNA methylation, which is one of the most uh, important uh, downstream uh, regulators of gene expression. And we wanted to look at the role of DNA methylation in the immediate postnatal period. So what we did is we, we started out by um, mapping uh, changes in genomic methylation and in the DNA methylation machinery uh, during uh, postnatal uh, cardiac development. As you can see here, uh, when we looked at the genomic methylation levels, uh, so this is uh, genome-wide uh, methylation uh, using an ELISA assay, uh, what we found was that the percentage of genome-wide methylation uh, was dramatically decreased after postnatal day 14. And you can see that the levels of genome-wide methylation at four weeks and 12 weeks of age are significantly lower than uh, during these first two weeks uh, after birth. And we found that this was associated with a decrease in the expression at the mRNA level of DNMT1, uh, 3A and 3B. So the expression of these methyltransferases was uh, lower at, at these uh, adult stages uh, compared to these first two weeks after birth. Uh, this is seen a bit more um, clearly here with this immunofluorescent uh, staining for DNMT1 uh, and DNMT3A. And you can see that the DNMTs are quite highly expressed during these uh, early stages of postnatal development. And then by day 28, um, they're completely undetectable uh, from, from these uh, four-week-old uh, hearts. So uh, we uh, have shown here using a, a few different approaches that genome-wide uh, DNA methylation levels uh, seem to decrease after P14 and that the expression of DNMT1 and 3A expression uh, also seems to decrease after P14. So what we wanted to do next was to uh, try to determine whether DNA methylation uh, might be playing an important role in postnatal heart growth. And so uh, we began these studies uh, by doing a simple experiment by uh, administering the hypermethylating agent of 5 aza 2 deoxycytidine uh, to neonatal mice from postnatal day 2 to postnatal day 12. We administered uh, 5 azocytidine uh, at a previously reported uh, non-cytotoxic dose. And so uh, we uh, administered 5 aza uh, each day uh, from postnatal day 2 to day 12. Uh, as you can see here from the, uh, the growth curve, uh, this is the body weight on the y-axis and the day uh, after birth on the, on the x-axis. You can see that these mice grew uh, normally for the first seven days. And then after day seven, they stopped gaining weight, and we stopped the study at postnatal day 12 uh, because they were, they were no longer gaining weight uh, and, and were not looking too healthy. And so uh, when we assessed genomic methylation levels, indeed, uh, we could show that there was a nice reduction in genome-wide uh, methylation in the 5-ASA group compared to the saline, so our pharmacological treatment was uh, inhibiting uh, genome-wide methylation uh, in the heart. And we found that this was associated with uh, a significant increase in heart weight, uh, and of course, when you normalize this to body weight, which was reduced at postnatal day 12, uh, there was a, a big increase in the heart weight to body weight ratio. So what could uh, potentially account for these uh, differences in heart size uh, between the 5 aza and the, the saline-treated uh, mice? Um, we first uh, began by measuring uh, cardiomyocyte uh, cross-sectional area using wheat germ agglutinin staining. And uh, what we found when you, when you look at the cardiomyocyte size uh, frequency distribution here uh, for the saline group in blue and the 5 uh, uh, aza group shown here in red uh, was that there was a, a rightward shift uh, in, in the cardiomyocyte uh, size uh, distribution uh, suggesting that uh, the 5 aza was inducing uh, cardiomyocyte hypertrophy. So these myocytes are larger, which could uh, potentially account for the increased heart weight. 
Uh, we've also uh, performed uh, extensive uh, analyses on isolated cardiomyocytes from these hearts uh, by flow cytometry uh, and cell counting. Uh, and what we found was that at postnatal day 12, uh, there was no uh, statistically significant difference in cardiomyocyte number. Uh, there was no difference in the percentage of KR67 positive cardiomyocytes. However, there was a, a significant um, reduction in the percentage of binucleated cardiomyocytes uh, in the 5 ASA group uh, compared to the controls. We then looked uh, earlier at postnatal day 7, so uh, before they uh, stopped uh, gaining weight and, and when they were still uh, growing uh, normally. And what we found was that this cardiomyocyte binucleation uh, phenotype was actually evident uh, early and it was quite uh, a marked uh, uh, inhibition of cardiomyocyte binucleation in the 5 ASA group uh, compared to the controls. And this was associated with uh, fewer uh, proliferating cardiomyocytes uh, as assessed by percentage uh, phosphor H3, uh, although this uh, just failed to reach uh, statistical significance. So, so what I've shown you uh, in, the, in the first part of, of these experiments is that um, if we uh, block DNA methylation during the postnatal period, uh, this is associated with an increase in heart size, uh, increased cardiomyocyte size, uh, without any change in cardiomyocyte number, uh, and it's associated with a, a marked reduction in the uh, percentage of binucleated cardiomyocytes, and we think this is probably due to uh, fewer cardiomyocytes uh, entering uh, mitosis uh, during this final round of DNA replication. So this is shown uh, here, which is what we think is going on at this stage, is that when we uh, block DNA methylation using 5-ASA, uh, we're preventing this transition into the final round of mitosis, uh, which is uh, required for binucleation of cardiomyocytes uh, in this uh, immediate postnatal period. So what we then wanted to do is we wanted to really understand uh, the relationships between DNA methylation and transcription uh, during postnatal uh, heart development. And so what we did is we took a genome-wide uh, approach uh, where uh, we took hearts at uh, cardiac ventricles at postnatal day 1 and postnatal day 14, uh, and we processed these for either RNA extraction and uh, mRNA sequencing, uh, or for DNA extraction and CPG sequencing using a methyl binding domain uh, enrichment uh, uh, sequencing approach uh, known as methyl minor. And so what we're able to do is we're then able to take this RNA sequencing data and CPG sequencing data uh, and compare the 1-day-old and 14-day-old heart uh, using bioinformatic analysis and, and look for relationships between changes in methylation across the genome uh, and changes in transcription. So what I'm showing you here is uh, our uh, transcriptome analysis of the neonatal heart uh, between postnatal day 1 and postnatal day uh, 14. Uh, and in the green uh, are the genes that go down from P1 to P14 and in the red are genes that go uh, up from P1 to P14. And we performed uh, gene ontology analysis and uh, which was pretty consistent with uh, previously uh, reported literature. And indeed, we found a number of genes related to the cytoskeleton and the TGF and wind signaling pathways uh, that went uh, down from P1 to P14. Uh, and of course, uh, various genes related to uh, cell cycle control. So um, not surprisingly, you find a number of genes that are transcriptionally repressed uh, that are associated with mitosis and various aspects of cell cycle control, uh, as well as cytoskeletal remodeling uh, from P1 to P14. What we also found was that amongst the upregulated genes uh, were many genes involved in oxidative phosphorylation, uh, metabolism, uh, the notch pathway, as well as uh, the uh, immune system. So we then wanted to look at, at whether there were changes in uh, genome-wide uh, methylation occurring uh, from postnatal day 1 uh, to postnatal day 14. And what we found was that indeed uh, there are a, a couple of thousand of uh, differentially methylated regions between P1 and P14, and that the vast majority of these differentially methylated regions are increased uh, from P1 to P14, so about 80% of the differential methylation in this postnatal period uh, is associated with increased uh, methylation. And so this represented differential methylation of about 4% of the genome from P1 to P14, and the majority of these regions are, are increased at P14. We then wanted to uh, get a better idea of the uh, genomic uh, distribution of these methylation events uh, during postnatal development. And uh, what we did is we looked at 
uh, uh, the genomic regions uh, where these uh, methylation peaks uh, fell at either P14, shown here in the red, uh, or P1, shown here in the, in the yellow. And the first thing you can see is the vast majority of these differentially methylated regions in the red are occurring at P14. And uh, uh, to our surprise, uh, most of these differentially methylated regions uh, are occurring across gene bodies at, at exons and coding sequences uh, rather than across uh, promoters and transcription start sites. So many of these differentially methylated regions at P14 uh, overlap coding sequences and exons, and very few of the differentially methylated regions at postnatal day one uh, were occurring at CPG islands, so actually less than 0.02%. Okay, so we then really wanted to understand the relationship between methylation and transcription. And we initially went into this project uh, rather naively, and we were thinking that methylation might be transcriptionally repressing genes that are, that are necessary for cell cycle progression uh, and, and that are necessary for um, uh, early uh, embryonic development. But what we found was a rather complex relationship between methylation and transcription. And so what you can see here is we've plotted the log fold change of uh, mRNA on the y-axis. So these are uh, gene expression changes, genes that either go up on the positive axis or genes that go down uh, on the negative axis. And then the log fold change in the, in the methyl binding domain enrichment on the x-axis, so genes that go uh, have decreased methylation on the negative and increased methylation on the positive. And so, yes, we can identify a number of, of differentially methylated genes that uh, show increased methylation and decreased expression. Uh, we can also find uh, some genes that show decreased methylation and increased expression from P1 to P14. But uh, we also find just as many, if not more, genes uh, that have this pattern of increased methylation and increased expression. So we've uh, performed um, some extensive bioinformatic analysis uh, to look at these relationships between uh, DNA methylation and transcriptional activation. And indeed, this has been previously reported in the cancer and stem cell literature. And what we found was that at postnatal day 14, uh, that these uh, increased methylation was positively correlated uh, with gene expression at gene bodies. So when you have increased methylation of exons at P14, uh, this was typically associated with increased expression of those genes at P14. But surprisingly, and, and rather unexpectedly, and we don't quite understand this result at the moment, what we found is that at postnatal day one, um, there was a, a negative correlation between methylation across uh, the gene body uh, and transcription, so completely opposite uh, to the relationship between methylation and transcription at P14. So... Indeed, we can find uh, a number of genes that are, uh, have increased methylation and, and that are transcriptionally repressed at P14. And we wanted to understand a bit more about um, what pathways those genes uh, might be involved in. And so we found about 167 genes that have uh, increased methylation and decreased expression at P14. And uh, these genes seem to be involved in cell adhesion, uh, embryonic organ development, the Wnt receptor signaling pathway, uh, and cytoskeletal uh, remodeling. So uh, many of these uh, are pathways I showed you earlier with the transcriptome analysis uh, are indeed uh, developmentally regulated in this window. Uh, this shows you a panel of some of those uh, targets. We've uh, validated several of these by bisulfite sequencing and qPCR. You can see many genes that are involved in the BMP signaling pathway, FGF, IGF, uh, and uh, TGF and Wnt signaling pathways, which have this pattern of increased methylation and decreased expression between P1 and P14. Okay, so to summarize uh, the major uh, findings from this DNA methylation study, which is ongoing, um, what we found is that genomic methylation is uh, dynamically regulated during neonatal uh, life, uh, that when we uh, inhibit uh, global methylation using 5-ASA in the neonatal period, uh, we were able to block this transition towards cardiomyocyte by nucleation. We've identified using uh, CPG sequencing uh, vast amounts of differential methylation between P1 and P14, and the vast majority of these differentially methylated uh, regions uh, increase from P1 to P14. And we've also found some uh, interesting and, and complex relationships between DNA methylation and transcription, 
And what we found was that at P14, uh, higher methylation at coding sequences was typically associated with increased gene expression, uh, but we found a negative uh, correlation uh, at earlier stages of development. And we've identified a subset of genes associated with important developmental pathways, such as the WINT, IGF, and FGF pathway, uh, which show a pattern of increased methylation and decreased expression uh, at postnatal day uh, 14. Okay, so in the first half of this talk, I've, I've told you about uh, cardiac regeneration in the neonate and the importance uh, of cardiomyocyte proliferation. Uh, we've identified uh, some important signaling pathways, and we're now interested in the role of chromatin modifications uh, in regulating cardiomyocyte proliferative potential. Um, however, the uh, cardiac injury response and the regenerative response is, is much more complex uh, than uh, simply uh, activating myocyte proliferation, and it, and it involves a number of different cell types. And there's some nice work from uh, uh, Michael Kotlikoff and Bernd Fleischmann's group suggesting that CKIT uh, stem cells uh, might play an important role in, in neonatal uh, heart regeneration. Uh, we've also been very interested in the contribution of immune cells and in particular macrophages in, in regulating this uh, injury response during early developmental stages. And I think uh, one uh, unexplored area where uh, we need to do a lot more work is in the role of uh, fibroblasts uh, and whether there's uh, differences in the extracellular matrix and, and fibrotic response that could account uh, for some of these uh, different uh, regenerative responses during development. So I'm going to present in the, in the next few slides uh, a paper that we've uh, recently published uh, on the uh, differences in the immune response between uh, the one-day-old heart compared to the 14-day-old uh, heart following infarction. And so what you're looking at here are, are facts, uh, quantification uh, data for various uh, mononuclear uh, and uh, macrophage uh, populations, uh, including mononuclear phagocytes, uh, LY6C high and low monocytes, uh, and, and macrophages or dendritic cells. And you're looking at uh, the uh, percentage of these cells uh, uh, in the heart following MI at either P1 in the blue or, or MI P14 uh, in the red. And uh, what you can see is that uh, there are some, some differences in both the uh, magnitude as well as the kinetics uh, of uh, 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 inflammatory cell uh, infiltration into the heart following infarction at these two different uh, developmental stages. When we look at the macrophages uh, in, in these hearts following infarction uh, at either P1, uh, which is shown here on the left, or P14, uh, shown here on the right, uh, you can see that, hopefully, uh, that there is a, an increase uh, in macrophages in the, uh, in the infarcted hearts at both P1 and P14. Uh, but interestingly, uh, at postnatal day 14, these macrophages are really restricted uh, to the ischemic zone, uh, whereas at postnatal day 1, we see them uh, uh, distributed throughout the heart uh, in, in both the ischemic uh, and the remote zone. And this is quantified here. Uh, you can see here that um, indeed we see an increase in the number of macrophages following MIP1 or MIP14. Uh, but uh, when we look at the distribution of these macrophages, uh, it's clear that uh, in the 14 day old heart, these are mainly in the ischemic zone, uh, whereas in the one day old heart in blue, you can see that they're both uh, in the ischemic and the remote regions of the myocardium. So what we wanted to do next is, is determine whether the macrophages were actually playing an important role uh, during uh, cardiac regeneration following injury of the neonatal heart. And uh, what we did is we used uh, clodronate liposomes uh, to deplete macrophages uh, from the neonates uh, prior to uh, and after following uh, infarction. And so these clodronate liposomes uh, are engulfed by uh, these phagocytic cells and then uh, the uh, liposomes fuse with the lysosome and they release clodronate, which then induces apoptosis, uh, so you can deplete uh, the macrophage uh, and phagocytic cell uh, populations. So what we did is we uh, uh, induced infarction at postnatal day one. Uh, we administered clodronate liposomes, and then we delivered the liposomes again at postnatal day two, four, and seven, and we harvested the hearts at either day eight or day uh, 21. And we found that uh, in the clodronate-treated mice, uh, there was a, a significant uh, reduction in the uh, size of the spleen, which was an indication that our uh, macrophage uh, depletion model was working. 
And we also found uh, less uh, macrophage staining uh, in the clodronate treated hearts at day seven following MI compared to the controls. So we were indeed uh, depleting the macrophages. And what we found was that uh, in contrast uh, to the one day old hearts uh, controls which were able to uh, regenerate following uh, infarction, we found that these clodronate treated hearts had a really uh, impaired regenerative response and had these very large uh, fibrotic scars uh, at day 21 following infarction. And we've quantified that here. You can see that there's a, a two to three fold increase in the uh, area of fibrosis in the clodronate treated mice compared to the controls. And this was associated with the decrease in cardiac function. So we're, we're really interested in the mechanism that, that might be um, uh, mediating uh, uh, this macrophage-dependent uh, regenerative response. And we initially thought that there might be an effect on cardiomyocyte proliferation, but we found uh, no difference in, in the percentage of proliferating cardiomyocytes uh, between the clodronate and, and controls. Uh, what we did find was that there was a, a reduction uh, or an impairment of the angiogenic response uh, following injury. This is quantified here, and, and essentially what we found is that uh, the macrophages following uh, infarction of the one-day-old heart uh, are actually required for angiogenesis. And we think this angiogenic response uh, is obviously critical for uh, regeneration post-MI. In contrast, um, there's many studies which suge suggest that macrophages in the adult heart uh, are actually important for uh, the formation of fibrotic scar. And so there's clearly something uh, very different going on in terms of uh, immune regulation and, and potentially responsiveness to immune signals at these two uh, important stages of cardiac development. Okay, so um, I've talked to you uh, over the last uh, 35 minutes or so uh, that, uh, about the importance of cardiomyocyte proliferation and some of this recent work uh, on, on uh, the role of uh, chromatin modifications as well as uh, immune cells uh, in, in regulating cardiac regenerative capacity. And I guess uh, in the grand scheme of things, what we're ultimately interested in is in trying to identify uh, either regenerative molecules or, or cardiogenic genes uh, or potentially microRNA-based therapeutics um, from understanding these neonatal regenerative mechanisms uh, to see whether we can uh, drive some of these processes in the adult heart. And a lot of our um, interest uh, over the last few years uh, has really been on the role of microRNAs uh, in uh, both the regulation of, of gene expression during cardiac development, uh, as well as also as potential uh, therapeutic targets uh, for a generation. So I think this audience is pretty familiar with uh, microRNAs. These are small non-protein coding RNAs. Uh, they're transcribed in the nucleus uh, as long precursors and then uh, cleaved by Drosha and Dysa to generate these microRNA, microRNA star duplexes. Uh, one strand then gets loaded into the RNA induced silencing complex, interacts with uh, messenger RNAs to regulate their transcription uh, uh, and translation, typically uh, either through mRNA degradation or uh, translational repression. Uh, we've been interested in microRNAs as potential therapeutic targets because uh, a single microRNA can often have uh, many uh, target, downstream target genes, uh, and these target genes can often be uh, uh, co-localized within a common signaling pathway. So a single microRNA uh, might have uh, the potential to uh, in inhibit a uh, receptor, uh, downstream effector signaling proteins, as well as a transcription factor within a given signaling pathway, uh, and, and therefore microRNAs uh, can act at, at multiple steps in a signaling pathway and could be targeted to regulate uh, entire gene networks. Uh, so we think microRNAs have uh, a potentially therapeutically uh, attractive targets uh, for induction of cardiac regeneration. So over the last um, few years, uh, there's really been a, a, a surge in, in interest in, in uh, microRNAs in various aspects of cardiac uh, regenerative uh, uh, biology. Uh, and indeed, um, a number of microRNAs, including uh, uh, the Jucca Lab's uh, famous MIR199 and 590 uh, combination uh, have been identified to regulate uh, uh, myocyte proliferation. And there are also other microRNAs uh, that can be used to uh, either affect uh, stem cell differentiation or direct reprogramming. So they're really emerging uh, as regulators of multiple facets of cardiac regenerative biology. So we were 
particularly interested in, in uh, trying to determine whether we could um, identify microRNAs that were um, particularly uh, associated with the neonatal uh, regenerative response. And so we've undertaken extensive uh, transcriptional profiling of the one-day-old uh, neonatal heart following MI compared to the 14-day-old non-regenerative heart following MI. And indeed, we can find a number of microRNAs uh, and genes that are either up or down-regulated following infarction at either P1 uh, or P14. And that's not surprising. But what was rather surprising was that when we took all of the microRNAs that were significantly upregulated, greater than twofold, uh, following infarction at P1, uh, about 17 of them, and we then uh, compared them to microRNAs that were either unchanged or downregulated following MIP14, so we were looking for reciprocally regulated microRNAs. We found only one microRNA, uh, MIR29A, uh, which uh, met our selection criteria. And indeed, we confirmed this by qPCR. So MIR29A is upregulated about uh, greater than twofold following infarction at P1. And in contrast, this microRNA is downregulated about twofold following infarction at P14. We thought this was pretty interesting because um, MIR29 has been previously implicated as a, a very potent antifibrotic uh, microRNA. And uh, we believe that um, we've uh, identified a, a unique uh, transcriptional response to injury in the one-day-old neonatal heart compared to the 14-day-old heart. And indeed, when we look at the expression of various um, genes involved in extracellular matrix uh, deposition and, and um, fibrosis that are associated with fibrosis, we also find that these genes are reciprocally regulated in the one-day-old heart following injury compared to the 14-day-old heart. This is periostin. Uh, you can see here that there's no change in periostin expression following MI at P1. This is at day three following MI. Uh, and uh, in contrast, at day 14, follow, uh, at day 14 um, MI induces about a fourfold upregulation of periostin. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a, a panel of um, previously identified uh, MIR29 target genes taken from uh, Manuel uh, Meyer's recent uh, circulation uh, paper. Uh, and, and we can see that um, several of these genes which are involved in um, uh, extracellular matrix uh, uh, and um, uh, collagen uh, synthesis are differentially regulated between uh, the one-day-old MI heart and, and the 14-day-old heart. So what you're looking at here, a, a sham-operated mice at P1 in the first three columns, uh, one-day-old infarcted mice in the next three, uh, sham P14 and then MI P14. And you can see that a subset of, of these genes, uh, particularly these ones uh, shown down here, uh, really are either unchanged or downregulated following MI P1, and then they're uh, robustly induced following infarction at P14. So we're currently undertaking a, a number of um, loss of function studies. These are underway uh, you, uh, by inhibiting MIR29 in, uh, following neonatal injury. But what we're very interested in is the role of the extracellular matrix and in particular fibroblasts um, in uh, potentially uh, regulating the fibrotic response and creating a permissive environment for regeneration during injury. Uh, and, and so this is a on ongoing work and um, maybe next time I come here uh, you can uh, hear more about it. So uh, it, just in the remaining few minutes uh, of this talk, uh, I want to um, uh, talk about some of the new directions that we're going in with this work, uh, and in particular, um, trying to develop uh, model systems uh, where we can begin to take some of these uh, mechanisms that we're identifying uh, in rodents and in neonates and starting to move them towards um, uh, therapeutically relevant uh, platforms and preclinical models. So uh, I think this field has really progressed um, uh, rapidly over the last few years, uh, and it's been uh, aided by uh, advances in, in stem cell biology and tissue engineering, which are really allowing us to um, generate uh, uh, nice uh, human uh, in vitro models uh, to begin to study uh, cardiac uh, biology uh, and disease mechanisms. And so we can take uh, pluripotent stem cells, such as human embryonic stem cells or iPS cells, uh, differentiate them into cardiac cells. Uh, using tissue engineering approaches, we can make uh, intact uh, cardiac uh, tissue constructs. And then it's been proposed that these can be used for regenerative medicine, but also for developmental modeling and drug screening. So I was really uh, fortunate uh, uh, over a year or so ago now that uh, James Hudson joined us at the University of Queensland uh, and, uh, from uh, Wolfram Zimmerman's lab uh, in Göttingen. 
Uh, and James is a uh, tissue engineer and stem cell biologist, and we actually uh, co-head uh, our lab together. And what we're interested in is whether we can use some of these bioengineering approaches uh, to begin to model cardiac developmental processes in, in human cells, uh, as well as for developing drugs and uh, large-scale uh, screening. So uh, how do we generate uh, human stem cell-derived cardiac tissues? Uh, we essentially take human pluripotent stem cells. We uh, give them a, a defined uh, cocktail of growth factors to generate cardiac cells. Uh, mixed population, including both cardiomyocytes and stromal cells. Uh, we then dissociate these cells, mix them in a collagen matrix, uh, mold them around uh, a silicon uh, post, and then we exercise them on uh, elastic poles, uh, which helps them to uh, functionally mature over time. And so as you can see here, compared to uh, human stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes in 2D, uh, which have very disorganized uh, sarcomeres uh, and which uh, um, uh, don't have the same sort of uh, contacts between stromal cells and, and myocytes that you see in an intact tissue. Uh, these 3D cardiomyocytes are very highly organized. They have uh, these uh, beautiful uh, uh, striations and organized uh, sarcomeres throughout the tissues. And they're also um, organized uh, uh, with uh, stromal cells um, uh, within these uh, intact tissues. So this is a, um, a video uh, showing uh, these uh, human stem cell derived cardiac tissue rings uh, spontaneously contracting uh, against these um, silicon posts uh, in vitro. And so what we're uh, really interested in uh, is uh, using this as a model system to test some of our candidate um, uh, either pro-regenerative or anti-fibrotic uh, microRNAs and then seeing whether uh, these mechanisms are conserved uh, in, in a human uh, model system, uh, which would suggest that there's potential therapeutic relevance. So what I'm going to show you is some preliminary data uh, which we've generated for MIR-29. And indeed, uh, we've looked at the expression of uh, the MIR-29 family members in both fetal and adult uh, human cardiac fibroblasts. And we find that the MIR-29 family members are highly enriched in fetal cardiac fibroblasts compared to adult cardiac fibroblasts. And this is consistent with our... Uh, our mouse studies. And what we then did is we transfected uh, the MIR-29 uh, mimics uh, into these um, bioengineered uh, human cardiac tissue constructs, uh, and we then looked uh, at several time points. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I think, three days uh, post-transfection, and you can see that in the MIR-29 transfected uh, tissues, uh, there's a significant reduction in the expression of both collagen-1 uh, and collagen-3. So this is consistent with our findings and the findings of many other groups on MIR-29 uh, from uh, rodent studies. Okay, so I'm going to uh, wrap it up uh, there and uh, acknowledge uh, the people who uh, made this work uh, possible. As I mentioned, I uh, co-head uh, the Cardiac Regeneration Lab at the University of Queensland with James Hudson. Uh, the DNA methylation project has been driven by Evangeline Sim, uh, who's a PhD student in our lab. Uh, Greg Keith, Ryan, uh, Ma and uh, Sindhu have all been involved in the transcriptional profiling and MIR-29 studies. Uh, the neonatal uh, regeneration work was initiated at UT Southwestern in uh, Eric Olson's lab uh, and in collaboration with Hasham Sadek. And uh, uh, Aaron Arora and Ahmed were uh, involved in uh, those neonatal regeneration studies and in particular the macrophage story. Uh, the DNA methylation profiling has been a collaboration with Sam Aloster's group at the Baker Institute in Melbourne and his postdoc, Mark Zeman. And we've been collaborating with Shizuka at, uh, uh, in Frankfurt on uh, our transcriptional uh, profiling and non-coding RNA studies. And we're also supported by a number of uh, funding bodies uh, in Australia. So um, I'll stop there and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you.